Robert Fish, Richmond sportscasting superstar, he formerly worked for the Braves, does work for the Richmond Spiders. He also does the state basketball championships with Gary Hess. He joined me on the Sports Buffet podcast a few weeks back. We talk about the college bowl system, and we recorded this podcast the night of the NBA draft. We talk about some draft prospects and much more. It's the one and only Robert Fish on the Sports Buffet podcast. A lot of people, when they think Richmond, Virginia, might think fine dining or might think it's the capital of the state, but I always think of Robert Fish first. He is the longtime sportscaster in the capital of Virginia, and he joins me here on the Sports Buffet podcast. Uh, probably the first time you've ever been uh, compared to fine dining in an intro, right, Robert? I think that is probably true, Bob. Thanks. Uh, you know, that's, uh, that's an honor to be up that high on the uh, Richmond Fort list in your regard, so I appreciate that. College football, uh, they're finally getting a playoff. Uh, were you surprised that it got passed? Uh, no, I don't think so. Uh, I wasn't surprised it got passed. Uh, I think there was enough clamor for it, so obviously the, the president felt as if they needed to do something. Uh, the question, I guess, remains is, yeah, it, it's better than nothing. You know, Obviously, we're going to get four teams now. Uh, I did hear David Thiel the other day, the, the fine writer from the Daily Press, kind of compare things and say, you know, you got four out of however many Division One football programs. It's kind of like having ten teams in the NCAA basketball tournament. But at least it's something, and I think it's a step forward. Um, you know, people like me would like to see more, but at this point in time, we have to take what we can get, and, and maybe four is enough at, at, at the moment. So we'll find out. It just depends on how to shake it all out. Yeah, and, you know, I mean, we're always going to have people that complain because, I mean, you know, in the NCAA tournament when uh, 64 got in, 65 was always uh, crying to uh, crying to the river. And now you're going to have a fifth team complain. But here's my question. Where does this – where does this really help teams like a Boise State or like a TCU or a Houston when they've had their good seasons? Because I don't know if it, the small guy is still going to get in to that uh, Final Four, so to speak. Yeah, that's a good question. That's one of the things that cropped into my mind is, is what does this do for Boise State if they go undefeated? And, you know, there's been some conference changing and some switching, and maybe that helps. But uh, it still comes down to how they're going to select the teams. It still comes down to the big boys running it, maybe. And, you know, the SEC is going to be lobbying to get two teams in. And, and probably in most instances, they deserve that, depending on their past seasons. But, you know, you're trying to get to that point where if you have an undefeated team, that maybe they've got a chance to be in that picture. But again, you're going back to, you know, now you're going to go to the committee. Who's going to be on that committee? Who's going to make up the committee? Who's going to make the decisions like the NCAA basketball committee? They don't always get it right. At least in basketball, I guess, depending on who the team is, more than likely your 68th team or your 65th or 66th team is not going to beat number one anyway. Right. In college football, you can probably make an argument that at least, you know, a 10th team or an 11th team or a 12th team could possibly beat the one team on any given day. And certainly five probably could beat one. So, you know, it remains to be seen how the TCUs and the Boise State will uh, come about out of this. And I don't know that we know all of those facts, but like I, like I said, it's better than nothing. And at least we'll have four teams instead of just two teams, which really were kind of chosen arbitrarily. And a lot of it, Bob, was dependent on how they were ranked early in the season. You know, in the old system, if you were ranked high at the beginning of the year, you probably were able to be, have a much better shot, as long as you didn't lose, of hanging around that, that BCS picture than you did if you tried to make a late surge. Absolutely. And, you know, one of my big questions, too, is for some of these teams that try to schedule, you know, just to get their uh, non-conference wins, is this going to force some people to up the scheduling and maybe, you know, uh, you know, a boy, somebody going to Boise or Boise going somewhere else, uh, does it affect the scheduling in your mind, you think, at all, drastically? Yeah, you know, uh, you're going to have to take care of your conference, obviously. And that's going to be the big thing for the really large conferences, the SECs and the Big Tens and the things of that nature. Um, you know, your smaller schools that are in the picture might try to get a stronger schedule. I think the bigger boys are still going to try to keep their non-conference schedule as light as they can. Les Miles was on the other day saying, you know what, well, we've got to consider scheduling when we look at this, but you also have to consider your conference and whether or not you take care of business there. So I think what will happen is when they, the selection committee, kind of like basketball has done, 
when they kind of outline what they are looking for, and once we figure out what the criteria for selection to be the top four teams is, then maybe that's how that will impact scheduling. Until then, it probably stays the same. If you're a college basketball fan, uh, in my opinion, you still have one more night of uh, something to look forward to, and that's the NBA draft. But before we get to uh, some players that you think might be able to uh, make a good career uh, at the next level, I want to talk about a uh, female that's going to make a uh, good career overseas, we hope. Uh, Abby Oliver, former Hidden Valley standout, and uh, did a lot for uh, U of R up there in Richmond. Uh, Talk about Abby Oliver and uh, the uh, opportunity she has. Well, she's one of the, the best players uh, in a lot of ways that, that I've ever had a chance to cover. And, you know, I had a chance years ago to cover Dawn Staley and, and that uh, University of Virginia team, and obviously Dawn's the, the best. But Abby was very impressive. Even when you watched her play in high school, uh, when she came up and did the state tournaments when we were doing those on TV, and just a very impressive young lady to watch and, and very well-spoken, comes from a good family, obviously, and, uh, just a class act all the way around, on and off the court. And as you watch her at Richmond, she's a gym rat. She's in the gym every day. She works hard. Uh, sometimes she plays basketball with a football mentality. And you know, her dad was a football player in North Carolina, so maybe that's where she gets some of that from. But uh, to watch her improve over the four years at UR was quite a quite a treat. And yeah, I think she's got a chance to be a, a really good player. And the opportunity to play overseas is great for her because, I mean, that's what she wants. You know, she she wants to play basketball. Her, her coach, Michael Schaefer, said to her at the team gathering after the final game of the year, uh, you know, I, I hope you get what you want, and uh, I'm glad to see you get every opportunity you can. And, and I think it's great. And, and I think she's got a chance to be a good player. She's a very heady player. She can shoot. She's worked on her game tirelessly. In fact, sometimes... The coaches were concerned that she was working too much, getting too tired during the course of the season. So I'm really happy for her, and I I think it bears watching, and I I think you're going to see some good things out of her. And the NBA draft, which uh, takes place on Thursday, a lot of people uh, say the draft begins at 2 with Anthony Davis taking uh, first, uh, probably by the Hornets, uh, the Kentucky player. Uh, I know you watch a lot of college basketball throughout the season. Who are some guys that you think could make some – Make some teams happy on the next level. Well, I think uh, you, you're going to be interested to see what the Bobcats do because they just uh, they don't have a player in in their roster right now that at any position that they're really you could say that they have a dominant player at any level. Uh, you know, the, Walker had a good rookie season probably, but they just they didn't do a whole lot. They need to, they need to find a scorer. Do they go the local route? Uh, you know, as you're looking at things, I think uh, Beal, the kid out of Florida, can be pretty good. I think you'll see uh, Gilchrist, the Kentucky guy, obviously have a chance to be pretty good. I don't know if Charlotte goes that route. Uh, do they reach for Harrison Barnes, who's a tremendous player, but maybe not able to create his own shot that well? And, and that comes down to the, you know, to the NBA ranks. Um, you've got to be able to create your own shot. So. You know, those are some guys that will be interesting to watch and see how they pan out. And looking at the state players, you know, I'll be intrigued to see what happens with Mike Scott from Virginia. He had a great ACC season, arguably ACC player of the year caliber stuff. Um, he was a little bit older because he had the extra year. Maybe that helped him somewhat against the college guys, but I think he showed he can play some on the NBA level. He may be a second-round pick tonight. Uh, Bradford Burgess out of VCU as an NBA body for sure. I don't think he'll get drafted, but I think he's got a chance to be a decent player somewhere. And, and it may, maybe he's got to go you know, to the summer leagues, the developmental league, or the rookie camps to make an impact. And after that, you know, it's kind of wide open as to what you might end up with. But I think those are some of the guys to keep an eye on. And, and who knows, you know, I was thinking about this earlier, but when we decided we were going to talk to them, Let's go back to when Michael Jordan came out of North Carolina. Could anybody really have predicted his impact on what he would have done as an NBA player? I mean, he he was a good player for the Carolina team, obviously, and came out a little bit early, but, man, did he take off. So I think it's tough to say who might be good and who might not be because but uh, you never know what's going to happen. But I think some of those guys are going to be really, really fun to watch down the road. Yeah, every draft is a crapshoot, no doubt. 